So welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to have you all here. This is the webinar titled What's the Big Eel? Taking a look at the biological and cultural history of the American eel. Uh, my name is Sarah Sra, and I work as a conservation planner with the Canadian Wildlife Federation based out of BC. And I would like to begin today by acknowledging that I'm joining from Vancouver, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations. Um, in this virtual environment, land acknowledgements look a bit different since we are located all over the country. So I would encourage all participants online to use the chat feature to introduce yourself, uh, your organization, and recognize the traditional territories from which you are joining from today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items about Zoom webinars. So you'll notice that your video and camera um, and microphones have all been turned off for the duration of the presentations. And you should have also received a notice that the session is being recorded and a version of the webinar will be made available shortly after today's session. And there are a few functions that I would like to draw your attention to. One is the uh, chat box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. So this is for sharing and commenting during the webinar. And in the chat window, please use the drop down bar too uh, to address all panelists and attendees. And at the end of the presentations today, we'll have a Q&A period, uh, at which time you can raise your hand and turn on your microphone and video to ask a question. Alternatively, questions can also be asked through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, this will allow us to moderate the questions better and to address them more effectively. And this feature also allows you to view the questions and upvote those that are most important to you. So here is our agenda for today. Uh, we are currently in the intro and housekeeping, then we'll move on to a presentation by Jennifer Saliboy, followed by a presentation from Nicholas Lapointe, and we will wrap up today with a 10 minute Q&A period at the end. Uh, so I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment here. So uh, I'm going to go straight into our first presentation uh, today uh, from Jennifer Sleeboy, who is the Program Manager for Aquatic Habitat Restoration, Wetlands and Species at Risk at the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources. Uh, Jennifer will present on American eel in the Bredor Lake, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and the relationship between eel and the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, she unfortunately was not able to attend in person today, but she has recorded her presentation for us. Uh, so I'm just going to share uh, her presentation. Just give me one moment. Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for coming to attend my talk on what would life be like without eel, Mima and gut. Uh, my name is Jennifer Silbo. I work for the Winnemaga Institute of Natural Resources. And I apologize I'm not here today um, to present to you in person. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, my contact information will be on the last slide. So I present to you today from Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. From 1725 to 1761, the Mi'kmaq and British Crown entered into a series of treaties that are known as the Peace and Friendship Treaties. The Mi'kmaq treaties are about relationship and diplomacy and maintaining and structuring relationships between diverse nations, Aboriginal and European. The treaties established political order intended to prescribe nation to nation relations in the context of coexistence, not to surrender land or resources or subjects of the British Crown. The Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources is an organization that represents the five Mi'kmaq communities of Unamagi, uh, in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia, on natural resource issues. Our goals are to provide resources for Mi'kmaq equal participation in natural resource management in Unamagi, strengthen Mi'kmaq research and natural resource management while maintaining our traditions and worldviews, 
and to partner with other groups sharing the same desire to protect and preserve our resources for future generations. So the Bredore Lake is a UNESCO biosphere reserve. It is a large estuarine body of interconnecting bays, Bearshaw ponds, channels, and islands. And it is situated in the center of Cape Breton or Unamagi. It was formed approximately 10,000 years ago and refers to two main components, the North Basin and the Bredore Lake. The average depth is 30 meters, but varies throughout up to 280 meters, and tidal range diminishes rapidly from the Great Bredore Channel inward, with tidal ranges between 16 centimeters near the entrance to 4 centimeters at Iona. Salinity and temperature varies by area, uh, but it uh, tends to fall around 22 um, parts per trillion in most of the urban regions. The Bredore Lakes are home to a variety of biota, warm and cold water fish and invertebrates are present. Primate commercial fisheries are lobster, eel, and gasparo. And the Bredore Lakes are of great significance to Mi'kmaq heritage in this region. The Mi'kmaq word for the Bredore Lakes is biduwa, meaning to which all things flow. The Bredore Lakes have provided food source to the Mi'kmaq through numerous fish species, resident invertebrates, bird species, and other um, aquatic species. Uh, the lakes are also means of transportation between hunting and fishing areas and are used for spiritual sol solidarity, such as Maligoyish or the Minigo, which is Chapel Island. So before I speak about the relationship between Mima and American eel, I want to start off with sharing this slide um, showing American eel migration routes from the spawning area on the Sargasso Sea to the freshwater homes on the eastern coast of, their, of North America. And as you can see, Nova Scotia is along one of their migration routes. The value of eels in, to Mi'kmaq culture is difficult to quantify. The value is not driven by dollars, landings, or economic potential. The value is in the life, culture, health, and spirituality they sustain. Traditional meals with eels are enjoyed today as they have been for thousands of years. Predominantly, the eel is a source of food for the Mi'kmaq people and is valued as life-sustaining. For large family, families, eels and the practice of eel fishing meant that they would eat therefore survive. In some instances, eels were the only source of food and were consumed three times a day for many days and weeks. Oil from eels was added to baby bottles for extra nutrition, and in doing so, children would develop a taste for eels and ensure their survival. Eels hold a special place in Mi'kmaq spirituality. They are often requested as a last meal to ease transition to the spirit world. Consumption of eels is relaxing and calms the spirit so that tr transition between the two worlds is without fear and or resistance. Eel heads are often let, left to the creator in gratitude as an offering for a successful hunt or to survive a harsh winter. And less obvious, but equally important, are the cultural and spiritual traditions that eel represents. Eel fishing rep represents a sense of pride, carrying on a Mi'kmaq family tradition that is as old as the culture. In the Mi'kmaq language, there are words for how eel is prepared, tools for fishing, and even eel slime has a name. Mima people preserved prey and never ate mussels. Because of them, mussels were the food of the eel. In a poem written by Mima poet Rita Joe, The Legend of Gooscap's Door, eels are a gift to Gooscap. And according to Mima legend, eels and tobacco were traditionally left on a flat stone in front of Gooscap's door as a gift to bring good luck to hunters, thus, this, thus illustrating its significance spiritually and to ceremony. To ensure continued survival and abundance of eel, traditional eel harvesters practice rotational fishing and customarily wait five to seven days before returning to a previously fished area. Freshwater habitats are not targeted because they serve as refuge areas for eels. Eels of a certain size are only fish. Smaller eels are not taken as they do not feed as many people and more will have to be taken. In the winter months, harvesters adjust the thrust of their spear to select a balance between smaller and larger eels that are known to bury deeper in the mud. There are times during the year when eels are not fished, such as during the blueberry harvest in August. The meat sustain us, the skin is used for boots, moccasins, soles, ties, bindings, crafts, and to stabilize sprains or broken bones. Tail is used for bait for other fisheries. The skins were also used as fat to cook other foods and as medicine. 
Oil from larger eels were used to treat ear infections and loosen earwax. I already mentioned that oil was added to baby bottles for extra nutrition and to help children develop a taste for eels. The parts of the eel that are not used are given back to Mother Earth as an offering to birds or buried in the earth as a sign of gratitude. The eel is linked to our Mi'kmaq identity and culture in a number of ways, and is seen not only in our language, but in how we fish it. Fishing for eel with a spear is the most common method and is done year round. Spears used in the summer and winter have different spearheads, but they're the same length from 15 to 20 feet. In the summer, eels were speared from boats at night with the aid of lanterns and at times generators, which enabled greater visibility into the water. Eel fishing with a spear would continue through the fall and into the winter out on the ice through holes. The practice of eel fishing is a time to rekindle relationships to water, eels, and nature in general. To others, experience is deeply spiritual and it becomes time to remember the deceased who have passed and pass the traditions to their children. Eel fishing rep represents a sense of pride, carry on a Mima family tradition. And others find eel fishing therapeutic and humbling. Others enjoy sharing eels and gathering for traditional meals with their community. In doing so, all are practicing and carrying on the traditional ways of the Mi'kmaq people. So what would our lives be like without eel? In my opinion, and the opinion of many other eel harvesters or Mi'kmaq people, it is unimaginable. Mi'kmaq people traditionally harvested adult eel for food and cultural purposes for thousands of years. I don't fish eel, but I grew up eating eel, and I know many Mi'kmaq harvesters who fish it, eat it, and share their harvest with family and other community members. According to Mi'kmaq, harvests, there has been a noticeable decline in their abundance. Overall, it takes more time to catch the same number of eels than it did even as short as 10 years ago. It takes longer to put food on their table, and they can no longer share as much as they once did. This is a tragedy for a culture whose foundation is to provide for and share food within their society. So overall, the population of eels have declined in the Bredore Lake, uh, more specifically over the past 20 to 30 years. Some regions appear to have better population, while some areas have seen drastic changes in abundance in eel health. The time it takes to catch eels, a measure of its effort, depends on which area of the Bredore Lakes is fish. But overall, it takes more time to catch the same amount of eels. Here are some examples of areas where fishing effort has changed over time. In Eskasoni, where I am currently from, the population has also seen an increase in effort uh, for fewer years, but I do not have a number to quantify. So why the decline? Well, according to Mima knowledge, there are two reasons. One, the bridge at Barra Strait, or Ayuna, was first built in 1900, and Ellerson thought it had disrupted the flow and impact and impacted the nutrient flow to East Bay. This resulted in a slow decline of eels. Um, by the 1950s, you could no longer harvest a significant amount. And the other one is the Kanzo Causeway, which was completed in 1955. It is also believed to have contributed to the decline of eel, um, mostly in the sense that it blocked off a, a potential migration route or a known migration route that they used to take. So this is an excerpt from our MIMA ecological knowledge um, study on Gara. So legend has it that a large serpent existed in lakes and people would stay away in the fall. It was later found to be an eel ball. This ball of eels congregated in late February in a river mouth and rolled back and forth along the channel for up to two weeks. Fishermen would make a string of holes in the ice heading upstream and each would have an opportunity to fish as the ball rolled past their next hole and on to the next. According to our Mima knowledge holder, these rolling eel balls are disappearing. So from our CSAR report in 2019, the DFO Maritimes region on American eel and Labrador, um, American eel are fished at the alver, yellow and silver stages. Alvers are defined in regulations as yields less than 10 centimeters in total length, and they're managed through an integrated fisheries management plan as a distinct fishery. Directed fisheries for yellow and silver eel occur for food, social, and ceremonial, commercial, communal, commercial, and recreational purpose, and IFMP has not been developed for the eel fishery. 
Minimum lens for recreational and commercial adult, adult eel fishery in Bordeaux is currently set at 35 centimeters. So for the management of American eel, as I mentioned, there are a number of commercial fishery, I mean, there are a number of fishery types, commercial, recreational, and Aboriginal. So there's a limited entry to commercial fishery, no com new commercial nice licenses as of 1993. Um, the seasons are set in maritime pro provinces, fishery regulations, and vary by gear type and whether the fishery occurs in tidal or non-tidal waters. Uh, there are gear spacing requirements, license conditions, and mandatory catch reporting for the recreational fishery, no license required for angling or spearing in tidal waters, provincial license required for angling in inland waters. There are 144 recreational licenses for pots, traps, but no new licenses in 1977. Um, recreational bag limit is 10 eels per day. For their, our elver fishery is just restricted to specific rivers, 108 in total, and it overlaps with the large or overlap with the large eel fisheries. Um, hope to be avoided. Uh, each license holder is limited to an overall quota, uh, mount type, size, and spacing gears are just restricted by license conditions. Um, and there are a number of other management measures measures in place. Um, there are currently nine. I'll get into the, um, the new Aboriginal moderate livelihood fishery um, in a minute. So there are currently nine commercial license holders. Mi'kmaq Community of Wagamaw owns one. There are eight licenses with 1,200 kilograms total allocation, one with 360 kilograms, and 108 ri rivers are fished in Nova Scotia. DFO cut the maritime elver fishery by 14% this year and gave that quota to Mi'kmaq bands to implement a treaty right to earn a moderate living from fishing. The intention of this interim um, redistribution of quota allocation is to increase Indigenous participation in the commercial eel elver fishery for the 2022 season. Fishers in Oceans Canada face a five-fold increase in Mi'kmaq fishing for baby eels in 2020, primarily on Nova Scotia rivers. Um, and we, while we do have a moderate right to a moderate, yeah, a right to moderate livelihood, uh, we do have to create a moderate livelihood plan that is uh, approved by DFO. Currently, there are two communities in Nova Scotia which have uh, elver licenses or elver fishing on their light uh, management plans. Uh, there are many more plans in the works, and I we potentially will see some more elver fishing. Mima elver fishers coming in. Uh, as you've seen, there are a lot of maritime elver fishing in the news. I just mentioned the DFO redistributing quota. Um, there are some other articles on inside the hidden fight over indigenous fishing for baby eels, why baby eels could be the next indigenous modern livelihood fishery. That was from last year. Um, two Nova Scotia First Nations proposed first ever moderate livelihood elver fishery. I mentioned those two. And most recently, a Mi'kmaq fisher dumps catch of baby eels as DFO moves in. He is a Eskazoni fisher who is um, not fishing under a, a plan and uh, still needs to, uh, to work on um, making his fishery legal. So there have been a number of efforts to reduce eel mortality in the maritimes, one being minimum size has increased from 20 to 35 centimeters. There's been a reduction of quotas in the elver fishery, not by much, maybe like 10%, um, and also uh, making room now for Mi'kmaq fishers. There are stricter catch reporting requirements. There's a eel or green crab license exchanging program. They used to buy out elver license fisheries, but with this year, um, they kind of suspended that because they were too far in terms of no negotiations between the commercial license holders and DFO. And one of the biggest changes that they DFO said they created is has set river quotas across the board. So some of the work that UINR does on American eel, um, we have our UINR Mima Eco Ecological Knowledge Report that I showed earlier, Gara, it's called. And we have an up, uh, we are planning to update that MEK in September of 2022. So we'll have a good little 10-year um, difference between um, information in the Bordeaux Lakes on American eel. Um, KMKNO, our Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative, and DFO have a working group on American eel. There's a CSAS process uh, scheduled this year related to eel in the Bordeaux Lakes, and it, 
the tennis review, they may have available information on the biology of eels. To assess whether management that differs from overall approach for the region could be considered. Um, we have a little bit different eels we find in Bredore. Uh, we also have our UN Aquatic Resources Advisory Committee, just some uh, fishers, knowledge holders um, to help us, help guide us in some of the work that we do related to aquatic species, such as you. We have our Abogana Model D project, which I'll get into shortly. And then part of the American Eel Coalition, who brings to you events such as this to um, bring about awareness to American eel. And Nick will continue to discuss um, more about that in a bit. So here's our Gara Journey of the Eels. It's our children's book. It can be found on our website, along with other books we've published. And Gara tells the story of an eel from its birth as a tiny leaf-like fry in Southern Sargasso Sea to mature silver eel who spent her life in the Bredor Lakes. It's also a story of the importance of the eel in Mimla culture, tradition, and day-to-day -day life. So the pictures that you've seen, um, illustrations throughout my presentation have come from this uh, journey of our eels book. And then finally, I want to talk about our Abogana Model D project, which is an NSERC funded project through Dal and with Dal Acadia UINR. Um, it's three year, we have four master's students, uh, community liaison. And it aims to increase our collective understanding of the movements and seasonal habitats of eel, lobster, and tomcod in Atlantic Canada's Bay of Fundy and Bredore Lake ecosystems. So it's joint participation and engagement on MIMA, among MIMA legal Mi'kmaq local and Western knowledge holders, and it's key to enabling better stewardship of these waterways and their inhabitants. So the purpose, so there are two studiers, as I mentioned, Bredore Lakes, Bidubwa, and the Bay of Fundy. Um, in the Bredore Lakes and Bid Bay of Fundy, there are two American eel studies going on. Um, I will focus on tracking gut out in the Bredore Lake and what we've, um, our master's student, Kaylin, had um, come up from that. So acoustic receivers are positioned at the main entrances of the Bredore Lake. The receivers capture the movement of eel in and out of the lake, and it'll help us understand the extent and duration of their range. Um, the data collected will help build knowledge gaps and determine essential winter and feeding grounds. So some of the findings that we found, so as I mentioned, purpose is to identify eel movement and habitat. Um, methodology is through tracking acoustic telemetry and mapping remotely sensed data. And the goal is to track and tag a track 40 eel, develop a diverse research framework, and develop co-management recommendations to guide stewardship. Some of the initial findings, which I should probably update now that Kaylin has successfully defended her masters, is that uh, the use of bear shawl ponds for winter dormancy and foraging um, aligns with what Mima knowledge holders had already claimed. 10 of the 33 tagged eels are using the ponds, seven in the summer and three in the winter. Um, the eels wintered at 1.2 meters and 25 meters. The depth of the water did not matter to them. Seasonal substrate preferences, um, they do prefer coarse substrate in the winter and more soft mud in the summer, which I thought is a little counterintuitive because we do like to see um, eel buried, in, or we do find eel buried in the mud uh, during our, our winter eel fishery. Um, and confirming what we've already known and why we do, we have a large, um, nighttime eel fishery as Mima people is that most like to move during the night. And that's everything I'll talk I want to talk to you about today with respect to American eel for and its relationship to Mima people and our relationship to uh, gut. So if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email address is not on here, but it's Jennifer at uinr.ca and any other information uh, in the presentation can be found on our website, uinr.ca. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, big thank you to uh, Jennifer for that awesome presentation. Um, I'm going to pass things right along to our second and final speaker for today, uh, Nicholas LaPointe, who's a senior conservation biologist for Freshwater 
freshwater ecology at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Uh, Nick will take us through the American eel's unique and fascinating life history and their conservation crisis in Canada. Well, thank you, Sarah. So yeah, I'm uh, joining today from Ottawa, the traditional and unceded territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And uh, I lead CWS Freshwater Program. Uh, I am uh, an eel, uh, among other things, uh, an eel scientist, uh, an eel fan. And uh, I wanted to start by giving a bit of additional background on, on what eels are and, and what their natural history is. Uh, and then we can talk a bit more about the global and Canada-wide uh, conservation situation for American eel beyond the Bredore Lakes. So here's some myths we hear about eel. Um, even here in Ottawa, uh, where there are eels, very few people know that they exist. And if people do know that there are freshwater eels or, or hear that there are freshwater eels, um, they typically have concerns and we've heard stories of anglers catching them and cutting off their heads because uh, they were, you know, they didn't like eels. And uh, so I wanted to take a minute to just dispel some of those myths. Um, one of the things on this slide is actually true about eels and the rest are not. Uh, so they're not an invasive fish. They are native to Eastern Canada from Ontario through Atlantic Canada. Um, they're often confused with sea lamprey, which are invasive in the Great Lakes. Um, but aside from having long sort of snake-like bodies, they don't really have any other similarities. Uh, lamprey have these uh, crazy looking uh, suction discs that they use to parasitize other fish and eels. Uh, no, just like no, fish. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt, uh, your presentation uh, didn't share. Okay. <laughs> yeah, glad you let me know. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, I can see it now. Okay, thanks Sarah. Um, so not like these lamprey, uh, they don't eat all their fish. Uh, they're primarily eat invertebrates and crayfish, and I have a slide on that later. Uh, and they don't bite people. They're very, very shy. And if you were ever swimming with an eel, uh, the eel would be swimming away from you or uh, hiding in, in the mud, as you'd expect. Uh, even if you stepped on one in the mud, it wouldn't reach out and bite bite you. Uh, I've handled many eels and uh, they're extremely hard to hold, uh, but they never tried to bite me uh, whatsoever, not even close. Uh, but they are slimy. This isn't actually eel slime. This is hagfish slime, which is pretty much the slimiest fish uh, on the planet. The hagfish are a, a marine fish, uh, ancient form of fish before they evolved jaws that still exist today, similar to lamprey. Um, so eels aren't quite as slimy as this, but I would say they're probably slimier than any other freshwater fish I can think of. So as uh, Jennifer mentioned, they're uh, a migratory fish. They're catadromous, which is sort of the opposite of uh, salmon, which are anadromous. Uh, and, you know, though we do have Atlantic salmon in Eastern Canada, um, American eel uh, are, are very abundant, very dominant. And especially when it comes to the Great Lakes area, at least the lower Great Lakes, Lake Ontario, um, and, and the Ottawa River, you know, these are really the salmon of the East Coast in, in some ways, but they're, they're the opposite of salmon. So instead of spawning in freshwater, then migrating to the ocean to, um, to grow, they spawn uh, in the Sargasso Sea, way down here by Bermuda. All of the American eel in the world congregate in the Sargasso Sea, the mature adults, uh, males and females, every fall and spawn there. And there's still a great mystery. We don't know exactly where in the Sargasso Sea they spawn. Uh, we don't know how they spawn or, or how many places they congregate. Uh, what we know is that all of these eels are genetically mixed and they reshuffle every year uh, with eels from Ontario mating with eels from Greenland or Venezuela and, and vice versa uh, in the Sargasso Sea. We've been able to track them to that general area, but we've never been able to uh, observe them spawning. So there's still a lot, you know, there's probably more we don't know about American eel than, than we do know. And so as the, the larva, uh, the eggs hatch, these larva, the leptocephalus that are sort of leaf-like eels drift on these ocean currents until they hit the continental shelf in all of these various areas, virtually every uh, stream in Eastern uh, North America and, and Northern South America. 
and the Caribbean that has uh, freshwater, you know, can get colonized by these eels. And as they start to hit that continental shelf, they transform into these very clear glass eels. Um, and then as they move into uh, fresh waters, they sort of yellow up as elvers. And they can remain in fresh waters for anywhere from five to well over 20 years, maybe even 40 years. Uh, and the males typically live closer to the ocean and in estuarine habitats and mature at a younger age because they all they have to do is make it to the Sargasso Sea. They don't have to carry eggs. Whereas the females are the much more long lived, they migrate further inland and they can grow to huge sizes over a meter in length uh, and they can carry 20 million eggs. Um, and uh, when eels uh, are ready to mature and migrate out, they turn from sort of a yellowish color to more of a silvery color. Their eyes get bigger. They, they make these sort of small transformations and uh, they migrate once to spawn and then they die much like Pacific salmon and unlike Atlantic salmon. And so they have a one-way trip out to the sea, they spawn and it's the babies that make this trip in, in Ontario, which is one of the furthest inland migrations. That's a trip of over 3,500 kilometers uh, that these juvenile eels make over a period of several years as they colonize fresh waters and then slowly keep moving upstream. And these baby eels up until the length of a about uh, 100 uh, millimeters, uh, 10 centimeters or so, they are able to make incredible climbing movements. They can climb uh, wet vertical concrete walls. Uh, and even as they get bigger than that, they're known to exit waters to get around rapids in, uh, in wet conditions and uh, climb over rocks and, and make their way upstream. So they're much better at getting upstream than salmon are. And in places like the Ottawa River that had falls that were impassable to salmon, uh, the Ottawa River was dominated by eels as their primary migratory species in the, the upper reaches of the river. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, eels like to bury in the sand, uh, bury themselves in the sand. Um, they spend most of their time there, so we don't typically see them. And they are uh, typically more active at night, not only at night, but uh, they'll come out to forage or they'll they'll forage from those hiding spots. Uh, they also like rocky environments where they can hide between the rocks. And they typically eat invertebrates and especially crayfish, um, occasionally small minnows, but the reality is even the adult eels, those big meter long eels, have uh, such a small opening in their throat that they can't eat our walleye, they can't eat our bass, they don't eat our big sport fish. Uh, they eat a few juvenile fish once they're older and mix that in with a diet of primarily crayfish. So that's, uh, that's our eels, you know, they're a really fascinating species. They connect places like Ottawa and Toronto to Bermuda, which is really hard to imagine. Again, this baby eel um, migrating that way, but that obligatory migratory behavior, behavior creates some uh, major conservation issues for this American eel. And we've seen these declines now for many decades, uh, you know, back in, in 1902 when, when the Chaudière Dam was used as a, a wood mill dam right in downtown Ottawa, right at the base parliament building. Um, there was a time where the, the mill stopped and they opened it up to check why and the turbine itself was just jammed with silver eels like this. So many eels were out migrating that they, they plugged that turbine. Um, you know, back in 1978, there was a report uh, on Lake Ontario. This is just in one year of 15,000 kilograms of eel carcasses. Uh, observed uh, downstream of the, the dam, which had been built for 15, 20 years at this point um, in the St. Lawrence River, and, and still very little was done. Um, in Lake Ontario, there's a peer reviewed, or sorry, in 1994, there's a peer reviewed paper that had described, uh, you know, really a conservation catastrophe for the species. So we're talking about 30 years ago at this point. And uh, this was expressed globally six years after that. Uh, in another peer review paper. So this is a long standing issue that we've been uh, well aware of. Um, by 2012, COSOIC, which is the uh, Canadian scientific advisory body that uh, assesses the status of species at risk in Canada, uh, confirmed that the species was threatened in Canada and recognized that the upper St. Lawrence River and uh, Ottawa River populations had declined by more than 99%. Uh, whereas in uh, the rest of Eastern Canada, there was a mix of some populations that appeared to be stable and others that were declining. 
globally, the species is considered uh, endangered uh, by the IUCN. Uh, the species isn't listed in the US, but it is considered depleted from a fisheries management perspective. And the species is considered uh, endangered in Ontario since 2008. Uh, Quebec and Newfoundland, they're sort of uh, vulnerable, which is equivalent to special concern. And uh, I haven't seen any assessments in the other uh, eastern provinces. So why is this happening? Well, you know, like many species, there's uh, climate change is having an effect on them. It's changing ocean conditions, and we're not sure how that's affecting their ability to meet and, and reproduce and, and drift on ocean currents and recolonize these freshwater habitats. There are issues of, of overfishing, commercial uh, harvest in particular, and, and Jennifer did talk about some of that. Uh, certainly issues with habitat alteration throughout their freshwater habitats, concerns about contaminants, concerns about uh, disease and parasite transfer. Um, but really when it comes to American eel, uh, there's, there's no question the biggest threat to American eel are dams. And the reason that dams are an issue is that eels need to get past these structures to complete their life history. Um, not all eels, because some eels can reproduce uh, downstream of, of all the dams, um, but the eels that are required to maintain that global population, much of their habitat has now been cut off by dams. Um, and unfortunately, much of the habitat of the big reproductive females, the big fat fecund females, as, as they're often called, uh, especially in Ontario, uh, you know, Ontario, the upper St. Lawrence River would have once produced a million eels per year. And these were the biggest in the world and the most fecund. Remember, I mentioned some of those eels, the biggest ones would carry up to 20 million eggs. And so, you know, it's estimated that with that loss of 99% of those upper St. Lawrence River eels, we've probably lost 25% of the global population of American eel. So, you know, when Jennifer points out that that harvest and especially the habitat changes to the Bredore Lakes with the Canso Causeway and, and uh, you know, other uh, structures that have altered nutrient flows and access to that, that's certainly contributed there, but there's also this global issue that the fewer big females we have contributing to the global population, the fewer recruits there are. That means there's fewer um, juvenile eels colonizing the Bredore Lakes because of the loss of those big females from Ontario. And so there is just a massive number of dams, uh, especially these hydroelectric ones. And the problem is these dams affect eels in two stages. The first is that juvenile eels trying to get up into these habitats, colonize their freshwater habitats, can't make their way past these structures. And uh, some of them do. We've actually tagged fish in the Ottawa River downstream of Chaudier Dam, which is a massive structure, six different uh, intake channels with turbines. And I think we tagged about 42, 43 eels and uh, set out receivers upstream of that dam. And two of those eels made it past that dam. We have no idea how. Um, it's not really an environment that supports them getting out <laughs> and climbing over the shoreline at night. Maybe that's what they did. Maybe they're finding under underground cracks. Uh, pictured here is the Chaudière Dam, uh, sorry, the Carillon Dam at the base of the Ottawa River. And there is a navigation lock that gives some access to this. So some eels make it past these dams, but you can think of those as like a filter where, you know, maybe 2% of the eels that historically past these dams, whatever it depends on the structure, maybe 10%, maybe 50%, maybe 0.1%. Um, if the eels make it around these dams and they mature, at some point at the end of their life, they need to get back down through these dams uh, to make it to the sea to spawn. And what those eels have to do is run the gauntlet of getting through these turbines because they follow the majority of the flow. And if that flow is going through the turbines to generate electricity, the eels follow it. And uh, some of them managed to pass on this big dam like this. The turbines are big enough and pass slow enough that each of those big dams kills maybe about 20% of the eels and 80% make it through that dam. Uh, if you deal with a smaller dam on a tributary upstream with faster turning and smaller turbines, uh, those turbines kill about half the eels. So if you're a baby eel that's gone up past one hydro dam, you've got a pretty good chance of making it back downstream. But if you somehow manage to make it past five or six hydro dams, again, you've probably got like a, a two to 5% chance of making it through all those dams un, unscathed. So we're really losing uh, a ton of our American eels. And, uh, you know, when I say here that uh, there are, you know, 240 dams in the historic range of American eel uh, in Ontario and Quebec, well, in Ontario now, 
out of those 91, there's probably only eel upstream of about 15 or so, uh, 10 to 15. The rest have been, eels have been extirpated from the rest of that area because they just can't make it past more than a couple of dams. So there have been some conservation actions to date. Uh, some of these are long standing. There was a ladder installed on the uh, Moses Saunders generating station on the St. Lawrence River uh, way back in the 1980s. And it was actually installed because so many eels were trying to make it past that dam at the time, a million a year baby eels, that they were crawling over the parking lots and uh, disrupting staff. And this was not a conservation action. This was a management action for the dam. Um, and that's given us the longest and best uh, data set on the abundance of eels. And we've seen the number of eels returning to Lake Ontario drop from a million per year in the early 1980s to uh, a few thousand per year today. Um, there's one recently installed in the Ottawa River at Chaudier Falls, which is excellent, uh, but there's still no ladder at Carillon Dam uh, further downstream. So this ladder is essentially a ladder in waiting uh, for some conservation actions to really be taken. And there's a couple in Quebec, but again, we're talking about, uh, you know, 240 dams in the historic range of American eel and, uh, you know, less than five eel ladders have been installed to date. So we're really not doing much about these American eels. Um, there have been some translocations, uh, manual translocation of American eel, the, the most uh, extensive of this was 4 million that were brought from Nova Scotia, these juvenile eels to Lake Ontario uh, in the mid 2000s. Um, and this was a, an experimental conservation action that unfortunately uh, was disastrous. Uh, despite attempts to screen, uh, what this has done is introduced a swim bladders parasite that was previously absent from Ontario to Lake Ontario and uh, never ended up producing the eels that it was hoped that it would in terms of uh, their ability to reproduce. So the thought was these small Nova Scotia eels uh, because eels are all panmictic and they all have the same genetics, basically, if we just translocate these eels to Lake Ontario, they're going to turn into those big fat fecund females um, and shows how little we understand about eels because that's not what happened. Uh, unlike the, the native Lake Ontario eels, a third of these translocated eels ended up being males and, uh, you know, would have left Lake Ontario to try to spawn, but would not have been big enough to reach the Sargasso Sea. A third of them outmigrated as small females, which Lake Ontario eels never do. Same thing, those eels would never have made it to the Sargasso Sea. And one third of them did actually become uh, large females, much larger than they would have on the East Coast. So there is some phenotypic response, response to the environment that, that led them to grow very large before outmigrating. But their timing was wrong. They left uh, way too early. Uh, sorry, way too late. Uh, Lake Ontario eels will start leaving in June. These eels were leaving in October, November. And so if they did make it to the Sargasso Sea, they arrived after the party was over. And uh, all these 4 million eels uh, were likely a waste. We don't know for sure. Um, it's very hard to, to track these eels. Um, but these translocations, these manual translocations are not really uh, a solution to date. Um, there has been some downstream translocations. Uh, Ontario Power Generation transports eels from Lake Ontario down past the two uh, hydropower stations on the St. Lawrence River to try to save them from turbine mortality. Um, but again, this used to be 500,000 eels that would outmigrate, and now they're probably saving less than 1,000 eels uh, through this uh, active transport. And in terms of installing safe downstream passage, uh, there's there's three dams where this has been attempted. This is a picture from Europe. But what you would do is uh, for these intake channels to the turbine, you can put up a screen that keeps eels from passing through, and then give them a bypass channel to get through. Um, but there's uh, you know it's very expensive to do, and there's limited evidence their effectiveness depending on the situation. Uh, on a small river, this is very effective, uh, and it's very uh, costly and, and difficult to do on a large river, if, if even possible. So most of the yield conservation has come from fisheries closure. Uh, hydropower has done very, very little relative to the scope of the problem. Um, almost nothing, despite those actions that I've just uh, listed there, you know, relative to the harm they've caused, that's next to nothing. And so the, the losses in the conservation action have been borne uh, entirely by, uh, by fishers. Uh, Ontario commercial fishing has been entirely closed since 2004 and recreational fishing since 2005. And the uh, 
American eel fisheries in the St. Lawrence estuary in Quebec have reduced their harvest rate uh, of the eels leaving uh, Lake Ontario. Historically, they would have harvested 21%. Now they harvest about 9% um, of those eels. And I don't think there's been further reductions since 2011, but uh, always happy to hear if there, if there have been. So we looked at, at Ontario. I'm gonna tell a, a quick story about uh, some research that we've done, uh, policy research. Uh, this is a partnership between uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation and uh, Carleton University. And as I mentioned earlier, American eel are listed as endangered in Ontario and Ontario has an Endangered Species Act that is supposed to protect them that was passed in 2008. Um, through lobbying efforts from the hydropower industry, the act was amended in 2013. And basically what this did was give uh, hydropower producers the ability to manage their own mitigation of American eel. So they got to develop their own mitigation plans uh, and their own do their own monitoring and only had to submit reports to the province if requested. Uh, and basically all they were required to do uh, by the act other than create those plans and monitor was to take mitigate to take reasonable steps to reduce the adverse effects of, of their facilities on American eel. So we had our suspicions that this wasn't uh, leading to much conservation or protection for American eel. So we requested uh, those plans for, through Freedom of Information and uh, also through uh, Portage Power and uh, Ontario Power Generation who shared their, their plans with us in uh, an effort to get feedback on, on their performance to date. And we developed a peer review paper that was published last spring. We asked whether all the facilities that are harming American eel uh, in Ontario are registered um, as required under the Act. We wanted to know whether the mitigation actions in those plans followed the best practices uh, outlined by the industry association themselves. Um, we wanted to know whether the uh, monitoring of the effects of those facilities was adequate and uh, whether the um, effectiveness not of facilities but of mitigation actions uh, was properly accessed. And so what we also did is uh, requested from the province the observation records for American eel to look at where eels are currently distributed in the, in the province and basically um, used an objective uh, external criteria. We don't know how the province as the regulator or the hydropower producers assess whether eels are being harmed by their facility. But our rationale was that if eels are downstream of a facility and there's habitat, historic habitat upstream of it, then the facility is harming those eels by preventing them from completing their life cycle by blocking their migration. And if there's any eels upstream of the facility, well, it's definitely harming eels in that case because it will kill a subset of them uh, as they outmigrate through the turbines. And so what we found was that there are 17 facilities where there's clear evidence that they're harming American eel. Um, but out of those 17, only eight are registered as legally required uh, through that regulation. Um, of the eight that were registered, they all had mitigation plans, but, but half of those mitigation plans just had actions like monitoring and training staff. Um, there were only four of those plans that had actions that would actually help eels get past uh, their facility safely. Um, most of those, uh, those, out of those four, most of the mitigation actions did follow the best management practices of the industry, so that was promising. Um, but overall, the, the design of their monitoring programs was weak. Um, they basically, you know, looked for eel carcasses or did some eel sampling to see whether eels were there. But there isn't one facility that could tell you how many eels were being killed or even what proportion of eels were being killed or blocked from passing upstream. Um, and uh, for the most part, even though there were five mitigation actions identified, uh, there were only two uh, effectiveness monitoring uh, actions, so efforts to monitor the effectiveness of two of those actions. And after reviewing all of these reports, I think the data we got went from 2013 to 2018. Uh, of the 17 facilities that harm American eel in Ontario, only two have been, two eels have been demonstrated to being saved from downstream mortality, and none have been uh, identified as having passed upstream um, out of this set. Uh, the, the ladder on the Moses Saunders Dam in Lake Ontario is managed not under this process, but through a separate operating agreement. So we really don't have uh, any protection for American eel in, 
in Ontario and this idea of letting the, the fox guard the hen house is uh, not uh, resulting in, in any meaningful conservation action or, or very little meaningful conservation action relative to the scope of the problem. So really what this falls to is to DFO as a federally listed threatened species. Uh, we need them to protect this species by, uh, you know, even though it's been scientifically assessed as threatened, it doesn't receive any protection in Canada. And that only comes through a decision to politically list the species uh, under the Species at Risk Act. But now it's been 12 years since the species, 10 years since the species was assessed as threatened and Fisheries and Oceans Canada has still not given their recommendation to Parliament as to whether or not to list the species. Um, if they do, then any killing of eels is automatically prohibited uh, under federal law, um, which has some significant uh, implications for, for hydropower in particular. Um, if they recommend to not list the species, then they actually need to provide some sort of management plan that will provide a viable alternative for uh, conserving the species. And so by avoiding to make this decision, uh, neither um, the management plan nor the legal protection of the Species at Risk Act applies. And so the question is, what, what can we do? Well, what can you do as citizens? There's not a lot. It's, this is not a conservation problem that is caused by individual action uh, in reality. Um, if you happen to be an angler and you happen to catch an eel, uh, please release it. Um, you can take a picture of the species uh, and submit it through iNaturalist. There's an eel project that allows you to put some more information about the eel you've caught. Uh, here's one of my records from last summer when I was fishing for walleye and caught a, an eel or fishing for catfish with, with worms and caught an eel on my hook uh, and uh, let that eel go, but reported it. Um, and, uh, you know, really all you can do is let your political representatives know that uh, this is unacceptable and that the species should be listed and protected. And, uh, you know, the one thing I would say is, especially in the East Coast, where we still have some stable American eel populations, um, we certainly uh, support uh, Indigenous harvest of American eel. This isn't, uh, you know, endangered, critically endangered species where there's only a handful of individuals left. Um, there certainly is room for uh, traditional and moderate livelihood hit fisheries for, uh, for American eel. Um, but, you know, there are ways that those can be enabled and allowed to continue under the Species at Risk Act while requiring hydropower to do more to take actual reasonable steps to mitigate their effects. Uh, and I do want to leave a little bit of time for questions, so I will leave it at that. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nick, for another really great presentation. Um, so yeah, for the remainder of our time together, we can jump straight into the Q&A. Um, just a reminder to please raise your hand or pop your question into the Q&A box. I can see there's a few in there already. Um, and for those who joined a little late, Jennifer was not able to be here today. Uh, so please direct all live questions to Nick. Um, so Nick, our first question came in from Paul and Paul says, I would like the Kenzo Causeway to be replaced by a bridge like the one that goes to PEI because the causeway blocks the water flow between the Atlantic and the southern part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Would you be supportive of this idea? And if so, how can we make that happen? I sure would. Uh, you know, I, I remember uh, doing my PhD down in the U.S. I'm from Ottawa originally, uh, learning how the Fisheries Act work. And uh, while I was doing that, came for a vacation in Cape Breton and drove across that causeway and, and recognized that it wasn't passing fish. And I asked myself, how could this be possible under the Fisheries Act, which prohibits the harmful uh, alteration of, of fish habitat? Um, the reality is that causeway, as long as it continues to be maintained, is continuing to harmfully alter fish habitat and is uh, therefore operating in violation of the Fisheries Act, but DFO is not taking actions to enforce their law. Um, so really to get something done there is going to take a grassroots campaign. Uh, CWF is working on a national fish passage program. We're looking for projects like that where we can partner with local people to to push to get structures like that um, modified so that they, you know, serve their purpose, but provide more environmental benefits. And, uh, you know, I think it's not something we could do alone, but uh, that is certainly a, a project that we would love to see changed and, and would love to help with. 
Thanks, Nick. Um, our next question came in from Erica. Uh, what aid structures and exclusion structures can be used around dam turbines to reduce eel mortality? The hydroelectric company should fund these as they are causing the losses. Yeah, um, you know, this is really the trickiest part of American eel conservation. On smaller dams, you can put those screens in front and, and give some kind of bypass to let eels go past. Uh, you can also um, uh, well, sorry, they're also conducting a lot of research right now. I would say not fast enough and not with a big enough investment, but there is good research that is funded by hydropower into developing uh, ways of sort of herding eels that are approaching a facility so that they can be trapped and safely passed around, looking at things like electrical currents, light arrays, bubbling arrays. Um, so that work is ongoing, but that's been gone ongoing for decades now, and there's still no solutions found. Really, the best thing they can do right now, we know that 75% of eels out migrate at night. We also know that in summer, when eels are out migrating, that is when uh, Canadians use the least power is in the middle of the night. And if hydropower producers allow even some of the water to spill over the spillway rather than through the turbines during that time, uh, when that power isn't needed as much, um, you know, that gives eels safe passage around dam. Even a subset, it even reduces the amount of mortality. Uh, but to date, I don't know of a management plan from a single hydropower producer in Canada that commits to spilling more water at night to mitigate American eel, which is a good stock gap while they do research to develop better technologies. So that's something they could be doing immediately. Thanks, Nick. Um, our next question is from Emily, uh, and she says, Nick alluded to the fact that migration timing seems to be something that's population specific, hence the wrong migration timing in the relocated eels. How is that possible when all these eels reproduce in a single area in the Sargasso Sea? Is there any genetic difference between different populations? That is a brilliant, brilliant question. Uh, and we don't have all the answers to it. And this goes back to this, like, uh, paradox of American eel. How can we have these distinct populations with different characteristics when they completely genetically mix every year? And so there's a few hypotheses for that. I mean, in terms of why do they migrate at different times, that's actually fairly easy. Um, the reason they do that is the fish that live in the southern U.S. along the coast don't have a very long migration to get to the Sargasso Sea. American eel might migrate about 50 kilometers uh, a day when they're out migrating. And so they need to leave at different times from further places so that they are all arrive around the same time. So that's, that's why they start their migration at different times and then all finish their migration around the same time in, in the uh, fall. Um, how they do it, we don't know. So is this a phenotypic response, which means they somehow in their genetic code, depending on where they're located, uh, you know, based on magnetic patterns or water temperatures or uh, their route to get there, they're, they're coded as to when they need to start to leave? Um, or is there some kind of level of genetic differentiation? And the first evidence of this is some work by uh, Louis Bernaches and his students, um, Canadian researcher, who look not at genetic differentiation, but polygenetic differentiation, which is groups of genes. And what they found was that they could identify eels that mature in estuaries. Uh, they could separate those from eels that mature in freshwaters based on a tissue sample uh, if they looked at the group of gene levels and used sort of advanced statistics to compare that. They could accurately identify where that eel was maturing based on that tissue sample, including even the Nova Scotia eels that were growing in Lake Ontario. They could tell that was a, a Nova Scotia eel, or at least an estuary eel, not that local. And what they said was the only way this is possible is that either eels have some kind of predestination. When they're born, they are heading uh, just because of the random code that they get from the mixing of, of eels. They're born knowing that they're going to go and settle an estuary or move up into freshwater, or there's natural selection on them, which means that if an estuary and eel starts making its way upstream into freshwater, it doesn't survive. It just doesn't make it to, to an older life stage just getting to know this, but despite that mixing globally, there is some level of genetic differentiation that occurs and it's one of the great eel mysteries. Um, Nick, we're at the end of our time, but there's about, I think, four questions uh, that I see here. Are you okay to stay on a few minutes to answer? 
I would be happier and, and uh, definitely uh, don't fault anyone if they need to drop off and get other things. Perfect. Um, I see a hand up from Kate. Uh, Kate, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? I was just wondering if you're relocating eels or the elvers like within, you know, 25 kilometer radius, would they still be unsuccessful or would that only be if you're moving them like a greater distance? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's probably a much better way of doing it. And uh, if you're going to trap uh, American eel, let's say at the base of a dam and then move them upstream and move them several kilometers uh, so that they don't just get sucked back down through the dam, uh, hard to imagine that that would have any consequences that they're already naturally showing they're trying to get up that river system. Uh, and eels are an incredibly tough fish. They deal with being caught and transported very well. Uh, they're very unlikely to you know, be harmed by that process. So uh, that is a very reasonable way. And it's not really that different from putting a ladder on a dam. Perfect. Um, our next question here uh, is from Erica. Uh, is there a way to assist eels such as capture and release to help them get to their destinations during migration? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a very similar question. And I think the real challenge is being able to catch enough eels. And that's where that uh, investment in developing technologies to herd eels, especially the out-migrating eels, because if you can herd them, you can herd them into a trap. Right now, if we have to go out and try to say net these eels, um, we're only ever gonna be able to catch a small portion of the population and we won't be able to help the majority get around uh, turbines. Perfect. And I see our last one here from Miranda. Um, and Miranda says, are there land mammal species that feed on the eels, like how salmon are important to bears on the West Coast? Asking from the prairies. Yeah, um, not to the same extent as salmon, just because of the nature of eels. Um, you know, they, and now it's, it's hard to say, I haven't heard of any, um, you know, it really would be indigenous traditional knowledge that would tell us if there were congregations of animals feeding on those big masses of out migrating uh, salmon. But I think that the, because eels live in the substrate underwater and mostly are active at night, there aren't a lot of opportunities for uh, land animals to harvest them. Um, certainly you'll find pictures of things like osprey and eagles uh, with uh, eels in their, uh, their talons. Uh, there's a crazy picture of a great blue heron with a, an eel uh, coming out of its throat uh, that it would have speared and the eel was trying to escape. Um, so birds will eat them uh, when they become available, but they're not like salmon that go into very small streams and then kind of spawn and die and their carcasses are there to nourish those freshwater environments. Um, so it is quite different from uh, from salmon on the west coast. Perfect. And uh, we just had a question come in from Emily. Uh, Emily is wanting your contact information, Nick. Uh, Emily is from Environment Canada, and uh, they are looking to, uh, for eel experts to uh, review some of their projects. I would be uh, more than happy, and I, I put my contact info in the chat there. Um, so my email address is just nlapoint at cwf-fcf.org, and I'd be happy to uh, hear from any of you, whether it's questions from the public or uh, uh, regulators or other real practitioners. Perfect. Uh, I'm just going to quickly double check here. Okay. Uh, is there an elver fishery in the Great Lakes? No, not anymore. Uh, and even the elvers. So uh, the reason these elver fisheries exist is because it's so hard to get adult eels commercially. Most of those commercial fisheries have closed. Um, what people are doing, and particularly in Japan, where eels are a very important part of uh, sushi, if anyone's ever had uh, unagi, that's uh, smoked eel as a part of sushi. It's not raw, it's cooked, but uh, commonly served. So these eels are raised in aquaculture. They're raised in pens uh, to, to produce that food. Um, but we don't know how to breed eels in captivity, so all we can do is catch these small eels uh, and then raise them uh, to larger eels. Uh, so that's where that market comes from. And because they're so rare, you know, we've got this problem where eel elver prices can be as high as like over $5,000 a kilogram. It's a ridiculously high price, and that creates a real new threat for this species that's already uh, under the gun. Um, and so we just don't have elvers that small in the Great Lakes. 
and um, we uh, we don't have um, that many elvers in the Great Lakes anymore. Again, even in the 1980s, which is two decades, the early 1980s is about 20 years after the first mega dams were put in uh, at the base of the Great Lakes on the St. Lawrence River. You know, you only had, you had a million uh, young eels uh, migrating upstream. And like I say, now we've got a, a few thousand eels migrating upstream. So there's just not enough to support uh, an elver fishery. And um, those, uh, those fisheries are prohibited in, in Ontario anyway. So throughout the Great Lakes. Perfect. Uh, we had another question come in from Sarah M. Are there efforts to monitor Sargasso Sea spawning? Uh, well, it wouldn't be to monitor, it would be to discover. And uh, I don't know of anyone actively trying to do that. Uh, I think anyone who is doing any sort of deep sea fisheries research in the Sargasso Sea is certainly looking for uh, American eel and European eel that spawn in a different part of the, the Sargasso Sea. Uh, that's one of those great scientific mess mysteries that hopefully will be unlocked in the, the coming years or decades. Um, but I don't know that they're actively looking for American eel spawning versus all the other mysteries that exist in, in the deep ocean as well. Um, you know, we, we know very, very little about the, the deep ocean. Perfect. I think that's all of the questions, um, unless anyone has any burning last minute questions. Um, yeah, I love that so many questions are coming in at the end there. Awesome. Oh, I think there might be one more. Let's see. Okay. We'll do one more and then we can yeah, that. one more last question. Uh, last one from Paul. Are the designs for dams being modified to accommodate the fishing uh, industry for future conservation? Yeah, well, I, you know, less so here in, in Canada. Um, we're real laggards when it comes to managing dams for fish conservation compared to the US and Europe. Um, those, you know, we're really the only Western nation that continues to dam our large river, build new dams. Uh, the US and throughout Europe, they are removing dams, not all of them, but certainly the, the deadbeat ones. And uh, we know in the Netherlands, for instance, there is a, a regulation on the books uh, for one of the rivers there that limits uh, cumulative downstream mortality for all uh, dams to, to 10%. So the, all the dams combined can't kill more than 10% of the eels. Whereas uh, here in Ontario, in the upper parts of the Ottawa River, where eels still get, you know, they have those dams have a cumulative mortality of like 97%, and we're not doing anything about them. So in the Netherlands, they haven't been able to achieve that cumulative mortality of, of 10%. And they're actually taking out dams that were built 20 years ago, because they weren't able to, to mitigate as, as promised. Um, the only thing that I know about in Ontario, for instance, in the upper Ottawa River near Temiskaming, uh, there was one dam that was installed that was uh, sort of renovated, retrofitted, that is past where American eels currently are able to get to, but is in their historic range. And through some negotiations and, and uh, consultation with the Algonquins of Ontario, what they did do is set up that dam so that it could be retrofit to, to pass eels and screen eels if American eels are, are reintroduced to that area. Um, so there is a little bit of movement towards that, but uh, what it's really gonna take is, uh, is public pressure um, and likely you know, with the increasing um, emphasis on indigenous rights and indigenous consultation on development projects, uh, a real change in how dam uh, construction and dam renovation projects are regulated. Perfect, thanks Nick. Um, yeah, so we are a little bit past our time together today. Uh, so again, I would just like to thank both Jennifer and Nick for their awesome presentations. Um, and I would also like to thank all of the participants who joined online today. Uh, we really hope that you enjoyed the presentations and that you learned a little bit more about American Eel. Uh, once again, we'll have a recording of today's session available shortly. And I hope that you all have a really great uh, rest of your day today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.